Chapter 15, Tracing Evolutionary History. So we're going to go over in this chapter kind of a brief overview of the theory given to us for the early Earth and the origin of life. The Earth formed about 4.6 billion years ago. And as the Earth began to cool and the bombardment slowed about 3.9 billion years ago, the conditions on the planet were very different from those today. The atmosphere was probably thick with water vapor and various compounds that were released by volcanic eruptions. This would include things like nitrogen and its oxides, carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and hydrogen sulfide. So not very hospitable for life. Lightning, volcanic activity, and UV radiation were much more intense than today. The earliest evidence for life on Earth comes from 3.5 billion year old fossils called stromatolites, built by ancient photosynthetic prokaryotes still alive today. Because these 3.5 billion year old prokaryotes used photosynthesis, it suggests that life first evolved earlier, maybe as much as 3.9 billion years ago. So remembering from your biology one that prokaryotes are cells that do not contain a nucleus and that photosynthesis is the process that we talked about um, when we talked about plants in biology one, how they are able to use carbon dioxide to produce basically their stored energy and release oxygen. So in this picture is an artist's creation of the early earth that we just described. And then over on the left, we have a picture of a stromatolite. The first life may have evolved through four stages. The abiotic, which means non-living, synthesis or creation of small organic molecules like amino acids and nitrogenous bases. So remember, in biology one, we talked about how there were four organic molecules of life. We had protein, carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids. And we talked about how those things were made up of smaller units called monomers. So for example, a monomer of a protein would be an amino acid. If we join amino acids together, we get proteins. And when we join those monomers, like amino acids together, we call that a polymer. So that's what we say here in the second point. The joining of these small molecules into polymers, so grouping amino acids up into polymers like proteins and nucleic acids. So the monomers of nucleic acids are nitrogenous bases. Now again, going back to biology one, nitrogenous bases were the units that made up DNA or RNA. So remember those letters, A, T, C, and G, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. If we group those up, we can create DNA. The packaging of these molecules into protocells, and a protocell is a membrane-enclosed droplet that maintains its own internal chemistry different from that of its surroundings. The origin of self-replicating molecules eventually made inheritance possible. In 1953, there was a graduate student named Stanley Miller working under Harold Urey and he tested the operin haldane hypothesis. Okay, so here's what Stanley Miller was able to do in the lab. So in this image, we can see the way that he kind of simulated the early earth. So here is a flask of water to represent the sea. And as it is heated, 
and that water vapor rises, there are some sparks to stimulate lightning. And this will create the atmosphere, NH3, CH4, H2. And then when that condenses with cold water and we collect the sample for chemical analysis, what do we find? So again, this is a simulation of the environment in the early atmosphere. Miller identified in that sample collected down here a variety of organic molecules that are common in organisms, like hydrocarbons, which are long chains of carbon and hydrogen. And he found some of the amino acids that make up proteins, which, as we said before, is one of the most important molecules of life. Hypotheses about the origins of life include, as well, deep sea environments near submerged volcanoes, or hydrothermal vents, or meteorites as sources of organic molecules. The abiotic or non-living Synthesis of small organic molecules would have been a first step in the origin of life. But what is the evidence that the next three stages could have occurred on early Earth? So we would have had to have had a synthesis of polymers. Remember, the monomers are the small molecules like amino acids or nitrogenous bases. So they would have to group up to form proteins and um, nucleic acids. Then the formation of protocells, which means those polymers like protein or nitrogenous, not nitrogenous bases, but um, nucleic acids. So nucleic acids would have had to been enveloped in membranes to form protocells. And then we would have to have self-replicating RNA. And remember that? we learned in biology one is ribonucleic acid. And there were two kinds of ribonucleic acid. We had messenger RNA, and we also had transfer RNA. The abiotic synthesis of small organic molecules would have been the next step in the origin of life. Before enzymes, hot sand, clay, or rock may have helped monomers combine to form polymers. Waves could have splashed organic molecules onto fresh lava or other hot rocks and then rinsed polypeptides and other polymers back into the sea. One of the key steps in the origin of life would have been the isolation of a collection of these organic molecules within a membrane enclosed compartment. So we call that the protocell. Laboratory experiments demonstrate that small membrane-bound sacs or vesicles form when lipids are mixed with water. As we know, oil and water don't mix, so the lipids will separate out. These abiotically created vesicles are able to grow and divide. The origin of self-replicating molecules. So today's cells transfer genetic information from DNA to RNA, to protein assembly. So again, we're having to pull back from what we learned in biology one. DNA um, is able to, we are able to do what's called transcription and translation, which was something that was a big topic in general biology one. Um, we are able to use the DNA to get instructions for building an RNA molecule so that we can then assemble protein. However, RNA molecules can assemble spontaneously from RNA monomers. When RNA is added to a solution containing a supply of RNA monomers, okay, now remember, RNA monomers would be those individual letters like adenine, then we would have guanine, cytosine, and uracil. New RNA molecules, complementary to parts of the starting RNA molecules, sometimes assemble. Some RNA molecules, called ribozymes, can carry out enzyme-like functions. 
Now, again, reminder that an enzyme is typically made of protein and it is going to speed up reactions and we use them a lot in cells. Um, and a lot of times we um, will see things like this ribozyme, which is an example of an enzyme, or we may see one, a lot of them end in ASE suffix. So lipase, for example, would break down lipids. Nuclease would break down nucleic acids, um, for example. Okay, so here's a collection of RNA monomers. Now we know these are RNA nitrogenous bases because we see the U in there. And remember, U stands for uracil. And we learned in biology one that uracil is a replacement for thymine. We don't see thymine in RNA. So here's a collection of nitrogenous bases that make up RNA. These monomers have grouped together to form polymers or simple genes. We're starting to team up complementary monomers. So as we learned in biology one, adenine likes to match up with uracil. C or cytosine always likes to match up with G or guanine and so on. Major events in the history of life. Prokaryotes lived alone on Earth for 1.5 billion years, from 3.5 to 2 billion years ago. During this time, prokaryotes began to transform the atmosphere. Prokaryotic photosynthesis produced oxygen that enriched the water and atmosphere of Earth. Aerobic or with oxygen cellular respiration allowed prokaryotes to flourish. The oldest fossils of eukaryotes, remember those are cells with a nucleus, are about 1.8 billion years old. The common ancestor of all multicellular eukaryotes lived about 1.5 billion years ago. The oldest fossils of multicellular eukary eukaryotes, this would be eukaryotes that are made up of more than one cell, are about 1.2 billion years old. The first multicellular plants and fungi began to colonize land about 500 million years ago. A fossil's age can be inferred from the ages of the rock layers above and below the stratum in which it is found and this can mark geologic time. Mechanisms of macroevolution. Extinction is going to be inevitable in a changing world. The fossil record shows that the majority of species that have ever lived are now extinct. Over the last 500 million years, five mass extinctions have occurred, and in each event, more than 50% of the Earth's species went extinct. Adaptive radiations are periods of evolutionary change in which many new species evolve from a common ancestor, often following the colonization of new unexploited areas. These adaptive radiations have also followed each mass extinction. When survivors become adapted to the many new vacant ecological roles or niches in their communities. For example, mammals underwent a huge adaptive radiation after the extinction of terrestrial or land-dwelling dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Evolutionary novelty can also arise when structures that originally played one role will gradually acquire a different one. Such structures that evolve in one context but become co-opted for another function are sometimes called exaptations. Examples of exaptations include feathers that might have first functioned for insulation but later were co-opted for flight, and flippers of penguins that first functioned 
for flight and were co-opted for underwater swimming. Phylogeny and the Tree of Life Phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a species or group of species. Phylogeny can be inferred from the fossil record, morphological homologies or physical similar traits, and molecular homologies. Homologies are similarities due to a shared ancestry evolving from the same structure in a common ancestor. Generally, organisms that share these similar morphologies or look similar are closely related. However, some similarities are due to similar adaptations because of their common environment. This is called convergent evolution. A similarity due to convergent evolution is called analogy. Systematics is a branch of biology that focuses on classifying organisms and attempting to determine their evolutionary relationships. So how are they related? Carolus Linnaeus introduced taxonomy, a system of naming and classifying species. Biologists assign each species a two-part scientific name or binomial consisting of a genus and a unique part, the specific epithet for each species within the genus. Genera are grouped into progressively larger categories. Each taxonomic unit is called a taxon. So for example, we have the species Felis catus, or the common domestic cat. The genus is Felis, and the specific epithet is Catus. But if we go back a little bit further and we follow through the, the tree here, we can see that the family that Felis belongs to is Felidae. So this would not just include domestic cats, but also wild cats. The order that Felidae belong to is carnivora. So this, these are carnivores, which certainly would include more than cats. The class Mammalia, so they are mammals, and of course there's an expansive list of mammals. The phylum Chordata, so these are vertebrates. The kingdom Animalia, because they are definitely animals. And the domain Eukarya, because their cells do have nuclei. Biologists will traditionally use phylogenetic trees to depict hypotheses about the evolutionary history of a species. The branching diagrams reflect the hierarchical classification of groups nested within more inclusive groups. Phylogenetic trees indicate the probable evolutionary relationships between those groups and the pattern of descent from the last common ancestors. So this is an example of a phylogenetic tree. Um, and you can see that it does, of course, it can, of course, become very complex. But we can see that they're all gonna kind of relate back to that first branch, which was the carnivora. And then that breaks up into the different families. So we have cats, we have the weasel otter group, and then we have the canine group. As new data accumulate, hypotheses are revised and new trees are drawn. The phylogenetic tree of reptiles shows that crocodilians are the closest living relatives of birds. They share lots of features. They have four-chambered hearts, they sing to defend their territories, and they build nests. These traits were likely present in the common ancestor of birds, crocodiles, and dinosaurs. Molecular systematics will use DNA and other molecules to infer relatedness. Scientists have been able to sequence more than 110 billion bases of DNA from thousands of species. This enormous database has fueled a boom in the study of phylogeny and clarified many evolutionary relationships.
The more recently two species have branched from a common ancestor, the more similar their DNA sequences really should be. The longer two species have been on separate evolutionary paths, the more their DNA is expected to have diverged or become different. The remarkable commonality of all molecular biology shows us that all living organisms share many biochemical and developmental pathways and provide support for Darwin's theory of descent with modification over time. Molecular systematics and cladistics are remodeling some of these trees. Biologists currently recognize a three domain system consisting of two domains of prokaryotes, so without a nucleus, bacteria and archaea, and one domain of eukaryotes called eukarya. And this is going to include the kingdoms fungi, plantae, and animalia. Molecular and cellular evidence indicates that the two lineages of prokaryotes, bacteria and archaea, diverged very early in the evolutionary history of life and that archaea are actually more closely related to eukaryotes than they are to bacteria. This will conclude chapter 15, and we'll see you in the next chapter.